Hello and welcome, it's Julie here from Julie Davis Flower Workshops and Flower Start, the online flower arranging classes. If you've been watching my videos for a while, you know that I am not a gardener. It's not that I'm not even a natural gardener. I do not enjoy gardening and part of that reason may well be because my husband is the expert gardener in our household. But as you can see behind me, we've had some of our garden cleared. And if you want to find out more about that and the reasons why we did clear the garden, you'll have to watch last time's video. We're having a bit of a debate in the house whether we just lay this bare area to lawn or whether I try and fulfil my dream of having a garden full of abundance so that I can enjoy cutting my own flowers and then arranging them. Last time we met, I was asking for your suggestions about what you thought I ought to plant in my garden. It's approximately a 10 metre long plot, three metres at one end, tapering to about two metres at the back of the house. It's west facing, so it's full on evening sun. And although our garden is south facing, it is actually quite shaded because the trees we've got growing at the bottom of the garden. Now, because I'm a bit more turned on about thinking what flowers I would like to grow, I've been taking special note of everything I see on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and making a little note of what I can see that people have been growing in their own gardens. And lo and behold, on my own bookshelf, I found a copy of this book, The Flower Ranger's Garden, month by month, by Layla Aitken. And this book is divided up into months and as I'm filming it's still June so I thought I would have a look and see what June has to offer and then flick through to July and see whether it'll give me a few ideas on how I start gardening from scratch. I've probably had this book about 20 years and I've never really looked at it but here I'm looking through the um, introduction Every king gardener become, become a proficient flower arranger. Flower arrangement is a natural follow-on to growing your own plants. Now I'm slightly concerned at this stage because I'm not a gardener looking to become a flower arranger. I'm a flower arranger looking to become a garden. So wish me luck. So I'm flicking through to the pages in June. And of course June is the month of roses. So I'm not going to be able to get things to grow miraculously in my garden so I can enjoy them and cut them. Quite clearly, this is going to be a long rolled out process. Now, the one thing I would say about this book, I feel it's been written the wrong way round for me. It's as if the author has got an already well-stocked garden. So she makes a few flower arranging projects and then sort of backtracks about what she needs to do. It doesn't really help you if you're not a gardener, but it does give you lots of advice. But from my point of view, of being a gardener that has absolutely no gardening knowledge, absolutely gardening from scratch, it's, I think it's too high level for me. It's sort of starting the wrong way round. But interesting enough, I can see what the author has growing in her garden in June time and then I will just need to backtrack that and she does give advice about when to plant them so it's sort of starting from the end point and working backwards but a few little things I have noticed is about plants to deadhead so this time of the year you should be deadheading your camellias, delphiniums, lilacs, rhododendrons, roses and sweet peas and then rather amusingly plants not to deadhead alliums, chinese lanterns, clematis giant cornflower, honesty, love in the mist, pampas grass, poppy and teasel. And why do I find that amusing? Well, of course, as flower arrangers, we want to use all these seed heads in our flower arrangements in the autumn and winter time when cut, fresh cut flowers aren't so plentiful in the garden. So a few suggested plants. There is the snapdragon, antirhinum, you probably recognise that. I get a quite a regular delivery of Freddie's flowers and there's been snapdragons in that quite a lot recently. So it says it's an annual, so it grows from seed every year. I need to plant it under glass in early spring. So that's a note I'll need to make in my diary. And it likes full sun to light shade. Well, that seems to tick the boxes in terms of my strong evening sunlight and a well-drained fertile soil. I think I've got 
that as well, and propagation is from seed. Now the next plant, well let's go on to this one, golden privet. So we do already have privet in our garden. In actual fact, when I look round, I can see it is a golden privet, and you quite commonly get the dark privet. And it does say here, it's often neglected and covered in city grime, and that can prejudice us to the real beauty of this plant. If it is well grown, however, it is spectacular. The new growth is limey green, edged with pale yellow and invaluable pale yellow and invaluable for flower rangers. It can easily be grown in a tub on the patio. And what I particularly love about the privets, we're so used to seeing them as clipped hedges traditionally on the front of our houses, but actually have these beautiful sort of cone-shaped or mounds of cone-shaped flowers, like a miniature pointed hydrangea. And they're highly scented, absolutely gorgeous. So this tells me it's a hardy evergreen, which is good news. It's going to grow to about four metres high. I need to plant it mid-autumn to mid-spring, which is the traditional planting season, November to March. It likes sun or shade, so I can tick that box too. And I can take it by cuttings, I can't imagine. I'm going to do cuttings, I think because I am brand new to gardening, I'm going to be buying things in pots where someone else has done the hard work. And perhaps if I do take to gardening, I can then enjoy trying to grow my own. And then something I wasn't familiar with, and I wonder whether this is because of the date of the book. I must have had this book for 20 plus years, but it talks about a meadow rue. And it says, this golden meadow rue is, a useful, is useful to the flower ranger, is as useful to the flower ranger as Acamilla mollis for both its foliage and flowers. So I have looked this up online. It's almost got the look to it of the Japanese anemone, lots of quite large leaves and then tall spikes and fluffy flower heads at the top. Of course, the Japanese anemone doesn't have fluffy flower heads, but it's got the same sort of growing habit. So, interesting me here, because over the years, I have occasionally bought plants of Acamilla mollis, you know, at church fairs and, and open gardens and things like that. It's supposed to be really prolific in the garden, but we have found it never grows in our garden. It does its tiny little bit and then doesn't come back. So I would quite like something that really took hold and if it's as useful as Acamilla mollis, it'll be really useful to grow for me. It's sort of one of those flowers that's part foliage, part flower. And then flowers that I have never heard of before. We've got the Jamaican, Jamaica primrose. Ar now here's the Latin name, Argyranthium. Argyranthium frut e sens, frutisens, frutisens. I don't know how I say that but it says it's often known as chrysanthemum fruitizens. So it looks like a very sort of traditional daisy-like flower. So again, I don't know whether this is a little bit out of fashion. I've never heard of it before, but it says here, um, it likes full sun, so that's a good tick here. And you can grow it from semi-ripe cuttings in midsummer, overwintering it in glass. Now another um, flower that looks interesting is Stefan Hans, Stefan Andra. Stephanandra. So again, it's quite an interesting leaf shape and these sort of small little white flowers. So it describes it as being tiny star-shaped greenish white flowers in early summer. Grows to about 1.5 meters. Again, planting mid-autumn to early spring, which is the planting season, November to March. And again, like sun or part shade, ordinary well-drained soil. So it looks like a good or rounder to me. What do you reckon? I'm just slightly concerned that the book is so old that um, you know these varieties aren't readily available. I'm just wondering when it was published. 1995, the year I got married. You can always tell an old flower ranging book. So you can see here it. Um, this book is telling its age with the type of arrangements that the lady is showing. They're just looking, or perhaps it's the colour combination, just looks a tiny bit dated. And of course dated by the fact as well that she's using flower foam in her containers rather than trying to go foam free. Which I would have thought that as a gardener you'd want to keep things as natural as possible. But there's some basic descriptions here on how to create your arrangement. So she's used everything that I've just mentioned to you, including a hosta. And then over the page, takes you through making a bridal bouquet using one of these foam holders, again, that's gone very much out of fashion. And included here a stilby, sweet peas, a couple of roses, 
pinks and the bleeding heart, which is Dicentra. And then the next project's making a buttonhole, obviously June being the wedding season, gives a little bit of advice on roses. The, the language of roses is a total mystery to me. Shrub roses, species roses, hybrid roses, floribunda roses, ground cover roses, climbers and ramblers. I think we've got climbers and ramblers in our garden because they are climbing all over our fences. And these are the ones with the really lethal spikes. Of course, they have to be able to hold on. So they're not, um, not they, they look lovely in flower arrangements, but they are really quite difficult to work with. And then July, we're moving into July. So it's midsummer, the month of sweet peas, pinks and roses, a wealth of annual flowers and foliage plants to choose from. So here, talking about harvesting flowers at this time of year, so you always want to harvest your flowers. Peak season is the time of abundance and where you make my pick um, your fruit and vegetables from the garden and preserve them for the winter months. You do exactly the same thing with your flowers. If you're drying flowers, it's not the dead flowers that you're preserving, it's the fresh flowers that you're preserving. And if you want to watch more videos on dried flowers, I will try and remember to link some in the description underneath this video. But there are some suggestions here. So if I wanted to have double duty with my flowers and have some fresh and some dried, it's saying to grow Ambium alatum, I don't know what that is, Celosia craspedia, those are the little balls on, what well it says here, yellow drumsticks, exactly what they look like. Gomfrina globa, I don't know what that is, Helichrysum, that's the straw flower, very well known for using as a dry flower. I'm no good at Latin. Heli, Helipterum, I think I'm going to give up there. Limonium, pink pokers, a pink flowering spike, I don't know what she means by that. Molucella, this is quite a sort of lush greenery, a spike with little papery florets running up the side with a few thorns as well. And a xeranthum, a wiry stem, double crested flower heads in rose, purple, white and lilac. It does amuse me, these old fashioned books. It never shows you, well, rarely shows you any pictures of what they're talking about. And other flowers for drying, Achelia, Amaranthus, I don't know how to say that one, golden lapweed, delphiniums and larkspur, gypsophila, lavender, solidago and zinnias. I didn't know you could dry zinnias. Now I do think my husband's growing some zinnias. He's got them in some um, planters at the moment, so hopefully, perhaps I'll be able to pinch a few of those and put them in my flower bed. Okay, look at all that colour there. So sweet peas, New Zealand flax, so Formian tenax. A flower ranger's favourite because you can do weaving with it. It, it. They get quite large and brutish. I'm not quite sure I want that in my garden. I want it to look, you know, as if it's an English country garden, not necessarily over the top cottagey. Honeysuckle, we do have a yellow variety of honeysuckle growing up our pergola. And the projects here for July that are recommended. A basket of flowers, look at that, the old fashioned flower foam. Oh, we have got all oh, chicken wire, but the chicken wire here is being featured because it's holding, it's giving extra security to the double mounted flower foam there. So an arrangement of um, lil lilies and roses, ferns and geraniums. I have heard actually that geranium makes quite a good foliage. Perhaps that's something I'll have to look at. I think um, Sarah Raven uses a scented geranium, a, a pelagonium. I'll have to, perhaps I need to get her book and have a look. So there's advice here on growing um, lilies and astilbes, labies and antle, pinks, which are dianthus, which we commonly call a spray carnation. So there's plenty to look at. So I'm not quite sure whether this flicking through this book is helping me or not. I will say that as a gardener who knows nothing, as somebody who's never really gardened before, I had a patch when I was a child, and I do, you know, I help my husband in the garden, but I don't think you can have two experts in one house, and gardening has always been my husband's passion. But I'm hoping now that I'm going to be able to dabble my toes into the world of gardening. So do let me know in the comments whether you've got any recommended reading sources or favourite YouTubers that you like watching. I'm all about, I think, the instant garden in a way. I realise things have to grow, 
but I'm not particularly interested at this stage on taking cuttings, sowing my own seeds. I sort of want to be able to go to the garden centre with a shopping list of things that I know are suitable for the, um, the weather conditions in my garden and the soil conditions and the external factors like my trees shading a lot of things. So I want to go with a bit of knowledge to the garden centre and I want to try and, you know, I just want to dig a few holes, put a few plants in, water them and hope they do their own thing. Now one thing I am quite interested in doing is looking into no-dig gardening because that is the reason why. <laughs> if you ask me why I don't like gardening, it's the holes. I don't like digging. I just seem to be so ineffectual at it. And I did speak very briefly to a lady a couple of weekends ago. We had an open gardens event in Faversham, where I live, in the southeast of England. And I was responsible for the market stalls in town. And one of the ladies that came with her market, one of the storeholders, was from a local community garden and she was telling me well i was attracted to the bouquet of flowers she had on her table but also she was selling off um cuttings of, of plants and but she was also selling plants as well and she was telling me that the ethos of the, their community garden was a no dig garden and i quite like that idea so I know the tiniest thing about the no dig movement. I think it's all about as you dig and for instance, as farmers plough their soils, you're constantly turning the soil over, making it more friable, drying out, making it more prone to the nutrients being blown away, being washed away, and you're destroying the soil structure. And of course, you're killing off the worms and the things that help your soil keep healthy. I'm just paraphrasing all of this. As you know, I am not an expert. And if you know about dig-free gardening, please again, direct me to all the important, useful sources that you can find for me. But I thought that might quite suit. So not only do I want to be more environmentally aware to encourage more biodiversity in my garden, I don't want to be despoiling the soil I'm going to be growing things in and then having to find I've got to put fertilizers on it because I've spoiled the soil structure by doing unnecessary digging. So I thought also my lazy gene coming in as well. I don't want to be digging over my beds. I just want to be able to do you know, spot digging to plant a plant, not digging over like you would have done with a traditional allotment. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And I do look forward to hearing all your comments and suggestions about what I should be going, growing and where I should be going for some sort of up-to-date modern advice. And if you've got suggestions of what I should be growing for my cut flowers with my watchwords, my keywords are stately home, herbaceous border, and I want abundance. I want to be able to go out into my garden in the height of summer and cut armfuls of flowers just for me to enjoy indoors and perhaps take along to my flower arranging classes. I'm not interested in becoming a flower farmer, but I also want to be able to cut without totally sort of denuding my garden of colorful flowers. That has to be enough for me to cut and enough to keep in the garden to enjoy. That's all for me for now, and I'll see you again next week.